morning. Hold on. I'm just... So good morning. Um, I want to welcome you to Fusion Church, where we worship together both here in the sanctuary and from near and far over Zoom. But wherever we are, we are together as the one body of Christ. Before I ask you to join in the call to worship, I do want to note a couple of small changes to this morning's worship. Some of you on Zoom have already noted, and those in the sanctuary have already noted, our new Dexter cam. Uh, it's pretty simple. I've just attached my phone to his harness, and he's on Zoom. He's on a separate Zoom account. He is muted, so if you talk to him, we won't be able to hear, but we will be able to see your face. So people in the survey that I did, which I'll be talking about in my next newsletter, did say they would like to be able to see the congregation's faces closer up. And I thought, what better way than to have Dexter come right up to your face? Uh, so if Dexter does come up to you, just lean right down. You'll be able to see yourself in my phone and you know, say hi to all those out in Zoom land. Um, also, all of the worship leaders, the people who absolutely have to be in the service, have now been fully vaccinated. And a good percentage of our congregation is also vaccinated. We are not going to require people to be vaccinated to come to the sanctuary. I'm not going to check vaccination cards, but I really want to encourage you to get vaccinated. If you have been resisting it, it will make all of our lives a lot easier if we know everybody here has been vaccinated. There are variants out there. There's still the chance that vaccinated people could be carriers. And so if somebody comes in and they have COVID, we could be carrying it on back out into the community. And so we want to be good citizens. We want to make sure that our congregation is not contributing to the spread of COVID. So if you have not gotten vaccinated, I really encourage you to do that before you come to the sanctuary. But as I said, we're not going to be checking anybody's cards. Um, also, because we have a larger percentage of people in the sanctuary that are vaccinated, I have decided that we're going to allow singing quietly. So as long as you have your mask on, you can sing. I'm going to have you stay seated so that you're not singing from the diaphragm and bellowing all your droplets out into the sanctuary. Um, but go ahead and sing in your sanctuary. And because they have definitely shown that COVID really can't be carried through um, staying on things, we're going to let you use hymnals again. We had eliminated hymnals because we didn't know if the germs stayed on the hymnal. But it's pretty clear they don't. So we're going to go back to using hymnals so that we don't have to have the extra long bulletins. Um, so make sure you in the sanctuary have a hymnal near you. It's the blue one. Um, and for those at home, I've started to print the, the whole uh, music, all, the sheet music, along with your bulletin so that you can sing along. If you want to come down to the church and pick up a bulletin, uh, uh, hymnal at some point so you can have it at home, we trust you. That, that would be fine. Um, I think that's it. So I invite you now to join me in the call to worship. This is from Harriet Beecher Stowe. Let us all resolve first, second, third, may God give us the strength through this time of worship to keep our resolve today and throughout the week. Let us join in worship together. Thank uh...
I don't know if I can sing quietly. <laughs> I will have to work on that. Um, at this time, I invite Sophie, where are you? Oh, there you are, thank you. Okay, Sophie, go ahead. Sophie is at college, right? You're at school? You're muted or something. Are you unmuted? Um, I don't know why it won't let you unmute. Hold on a second. I gave you permission. What you could do is, you know, you could read it now and, and mouth sync it. <laughs> All right, wait a second. I also lost her in my gallery. Sophie, you're just really hard to find here. Okay, well, I'm not sure we're going to get sound from Sophie, so I can't even find her anymore in my gallery. Do you see her, Ramin? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, go. <laughs> um, Jesus said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Thank you. And thank you for enduring our technical difficulties. <laughs> of course. Good to see you. So the uh, scripture that Sophie read today should have been a very familiar one. It's the Lord's Prayer. And we call it the Lord's Prayer because the disciples asked Jesus, how then shall we pray? And Jesus said, this is how you pray. And Christians have been saying that prayer in various versions, but pretty close to one another for over 2,000 years. And so the Lord's Prayer is a very important prayer to the church. It's not the only prayer that Christians say. And obviously all of us have said a lot of prayers in our lives as well. And if you go to the internet, you can find skids, skids, thousands and thousands of prayers that people will suggest that you could use in your own prayer life. Today, what I wanna do is compare a couple of the prayers, the typical prayers that you would find on the internet or that you might've prayed yourself, to what the Lord's Prayer says, and see if we can find one of the fundamental differences between a lot of those prayers and the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. And I'm going to ask uh, Dexter here to help me. And so what I'm going to do, here, Dexter, come sit over here. Sit. In this thing, I have some crackers. Some tasty, tasty crackers. Yes. Mm, he knows what he does when he gets to crackers. Okay, I'm going to read a prayer. And every time in the prayer, there is a word that is in the first person singular. What, what, what words would be the first person singular? I, me, myself. Yeah, those kinds of words. Every time I, you hear one of those words, I get to eat a cracker. Okay. Every time you hear something in the first person plural, which would be we, our, ourselves, Dexter gets to eat a cracker. Okay. So let's see. Let's see who gets more crackers. Sit. Okay. Prayer number one. Dear God, thank you for, for, for being the father who craves and lavishes love and goodness toward me. 
helped me to recognize it, accept it, and embrace it. Your love leads, I'm not gonna eat them all, me to life far beyond what I could hope or imagine. May I look to you for comfort and protection. I choose to find my, re my rest in you. Amen. Sorry. Okay, let's try another prayer. Dear Lord, in your, these are all prayers I got off the internet. Dear Lord, in your presence, I find joy and security. Thank you for being my defender and guide. Thank you for offering me access to your personal protection and direction. Please help me know how to handle my problems and the people around me. Poor Dexter. <laughs> He's drooling. <laughs> Okay, let's try prayer number three. Dear Heavenly Redeemer, please give me the power and strength to surrender my way and follow your best way. I trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. How many of you are feeling a little sorry for Dexter? Yeah, <laughs> well, sorry, other. Okay, let's try the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen which prayer do you think dexter likes <laughs> it's not that the prayer is using i or me are wrong Sometimes we have personal things that we need to pray about. But too often, I think, we pray as if God is our personal servant, as if God is there to do things for us, and God's love belongs to us and no one else. When Jesus said we are to pray, Jesus was emphasizing the community, the church, all of us together. Not give me my bread, but God give us our bread. We wish and pray that there will be enough bread for everyone, even for Dexter. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God, help us when we pray to you to recognize that we are praying not only for our needs, but the needs of all of your children. Help us to embrace your children and your love for all the world and expand the way that we pray. And hear us now as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Uh, for those who are wondering what suddenly happened to the Dexter cam, I actually took my phone off because I used my phone to record the sermon for my podcast. So, sorry, Dexter cam is over. He's just lying here anyway. The rest of the service, he just sleeps by my side and all you'd see was the ceiling anyway. So, I do have a few other announcements. Um, the mission of the month for April, this is our last Sunday in April, and it is the food pantry. As I've mentioned, you can bring food um, canned good, goods and things like that to donate, or you can make out a check to the church with food pantry on the memo line so that we can use that to buy uh, perishable items for the food pantry. You also should have gotten in the mail your stewardship packet. For those unfamiliar with our church year, our financial year and our program year actually ends April 30th because we follow an academic calendar more or less. And so May 1st will begin our new um, year, and so you should have gotten a stewardship packet. We sent it out to all of those that we know in the past have given. If you did not get a stewardship packet and are interested in giving on a regular basis, let us know and we can send you that. And in the packet, there's not only the pledge card and information about our finances for the next year, but also um, there is a sheet that you can fill out to volunteer for various things. So. If you're not on our stewardship list and you're not sure you're ready to pledge, but you would like to contribute flowers on a Sunday or be lay leader either through Zoom or here in person, anything like that, uh, make sure you pick up one of those sheets. I think it's also on our website. You can download it and um, express your interest in that so that we can boards can know as they're filling out next year's volunteer opportunities. I also saw in the chat that it is Sage Powell's 17th birthday, so happy birthday to Sage. I hope you have a great day today. My sister's birthday is today, too, so you share, share a birthday with my sister. Are there other announcements that you would like to let us know about? And I'll start with the sanctuary. Anybody in the sanctuary have any announcements? Does anybody on Zoom have any announcements that they would like to? us to know about. Just raise your hand right in Zoom if you have anything. Keep quiet week. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording and I invite you to join me in prayer when I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond. Hear our prayer. God of strength and compassion, we come now into your presence knowing that in your word and spirit we will find guidance in our confusion, calm for our fears, and hope for our future. We pray this week for our nation, that we may continue to seek justice for all people and work to create a society where every person feels safe from hatred and bigotry. May the names of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, and too many others spur us to continue to pursue justice. And may these troubled times be the birth pangs of a better nation, a more equitable country, and a future of peace for all people. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in our country and around the world who continue to sicken and die from COVID-19. May each of us have the humility and persistence to do what is necessary to bring this pandemic to an end for the sake of all people. We pray for those who are sick in body, in mind, and in spirit, that they may find healing and that they may know comfort in our attentive concern. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are struggling financially, for the unemployed, the homeless, we pray for those who are oppressed. We pray for Ding Jiashi, that he and his family may know how close we hold them in our hearts. May all who suffer from oppression of any sort be set free from the bonds which keep them from living fully. Lord, in your mercy. On this Earth Day weekend, God, we give thanks for the beauty and the abundance of your creation and we pray for the will to work for the earth, its health, and its preservation. Help us to act now for the good of the land, water, and air, remembering that the earth does not exist only for us, but for the enjoyment of all of your creatures. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray for our families and our loved ones. And we give thanks for those who have sustained us during this time. And when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, we hold one another in prayer. And I invite you to take a moment and silently lift in your heart the names of those that you wish to hold in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray finally for ourselves, that we may have patience with one another in these stressful times, that we may look for opportunities to create beauty and spread joy and hope, that we may work for the common good, be steadfast in love, walk steadfastly in faith, and always cultivate peace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, accept these prayers as a sign of our desire to be at one with you and at one with each other living out our lives in peace and compassion as Christ has called us to live. In his name we pray. Amen. Um, time of offering ourselves in commitment. Jesus called us to be workers in God's field, sowing generosity, healing, and peace to bring a great harvest of mercy and love. Let us bring our gifts of resources, time, and commitment so that the ministry of this church will be a growing, vibrant witness to God's love. God of grace, we give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and give us the assurance of your attention to our needs and the needs of others. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joys be in our souls. Amen.
please join me in the responsive reading. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 28, chapter 16, verse 8, chapter 14, verse 30, and chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Those who trust in their riches will fall. The righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Better a little with righteousness. Than much gain with injustice. A heart at peace gives life to the body. But envy rots the bones. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. But give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you. And say, who is the Lord? For I may become poor and steal. And so dishonor the name of my God. The scripture reading for today is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have re revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And for the third time today, let me read to you once again, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Jesus said to his disciples, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Spring is finally arriving here in western New York, and the birds are returning to my property. Although I put out seed all winter, I've had to increase my offerings in order to accommodate the additional traffic. Over the winter, I hosted chickadees, nuthatches, and red poles, but the red poles have flown north, and the purple finches, gold finches, juncos, and mourning doves have taken their place. The juncos and the finches were actually here all winter, but they only visited my feeder periodically. Now, however, they are practically living at it as they try to fuel their bodies to prepare for the rigors of the child-rearing season. This time of year is actually one of the most difficult for animals because the dried berries and the seeds that sustain them through the winter months are mostly depleted while the warming earth hasn't yet produced enough new growth for them to eat. In earlier times when people lived closer to the land, human beings faced the same problem. And this time of year, after the winter stores were running low, but the new crops hadn't yet come to fruit, was traditionally known as the hunger gap. During the hunger gap, families had to supplement their meager supplies by foraging for early spring wild plants. So they added the leaves of young nettles to their soup, and they hiked through the woods looking for wild leeks. They would gather dandelion greens for, sips, for salads, grind up dandelion roots for coffee, or pop the dandelion heads into vats to ferment for a horrible tasting dandelion wine. And I speak from experience. My father, loved to experiment with wild edible foods. And so he put all of his children to work in the spring collecting dandelion heads for the wine that he brewed in our basement. That's one family tradition I am frankly happy to forego. In fact, after a childhood of sampling milkweed, burdock, lamb's quarters, chicory, arrowroot, wood sorrel, clover, and cattails, I developed a great love for cultivated vegetables that you can buy in the grocery store. 
knowing how to forage for edible plants is fun, and I don't begrudge those years of taste testing with my father at all. It gave me an appreciation for the earth around us. But it also left me acutely aware of how rigorous life was for humanity before the development of agriculture. Feeding yourself back then was a full-time job. And a late spring could mean starvation. How comforting it is to be able to walk into Wegmans no matter the time of year and choose from an abundance of crops. While some of us might like an occasional challenge of trying to survive in the woods with only a jackknife in our wits, few of us actually really want to make a lifestyle out of it. Because as much fun as we might find it for a short time, we also like to have time for other things other than physical survival, like playing baseball, or reading a good book. The development of agriculture allowed human beings the luxury of engaging in activities that feed our minds and feed our spirits, as well as feeding our bodies. And it is those activities that separate us from most of the animal world. You know, even if chickadees had brains big enough to read a book, they wouldn't have time to read, because survival requires all of their attention. A chickadee eats a third of its weight every day, and it has to eat about every half hour just to keep its body warm and functioning. So without a Wegmans to supply its needs, a chickadee's whole day is filled with the search for food. For chickadees and for most creatures on Earth, the purpose of life is simply to survive. To survive long enough to pass your genes on to the next generation whose purpose is to spend their days surviving. And unfortunately for some human beings who are trapped in poverty or fleeing from the devastation of war, their lives too are reduced to that fundamental level of just trying to physically survive another day. It's only those of us who are fortunate enough to have our physical daily needs, needs met with dependable certainty, who have enough time and enough resources to spend on mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. Therefore, every moment that you spend not hunting for food is a gift. Every dollar you spend on something besides securing your survival for the next day is a blessing. How are you using that gift? Are you squandering your time and money on things that don't last, on meaningless pursuits or empty possessions? Or are your choices augmenting your life and the lives of others? Are you using your blessing to create a life of blessing in the world? In Matthew 6, Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, and in verse 11 he says, Give us this day our daily bread. That word daily can also be translated as sufficient. Give us this day bread that is sufficient for our needs. Now when the disciples heard those words, they would have immediately remembered the story that formed the central narrative of their identity as Jewish people, the story of the Exodus. When God freed the people from slavery and led them through the wilderness to the promised land. Because during those hard days in the wilderness, when survival it was really tough. God provided the Israelites with manna to meet their daily needs. Every morning, people would gather this white substance from the ground that God had sent during the night and then bake it into bread for the day's meals. And if they attempted to gather more than they needed for that day and hoard that manna overnight, the manna would spoil and maggots would fill the storage jar. God wanted them to know that their daily needs would be met and they could trust that. God wanted to ease the Israelites' fears about their daily physical needs in order to give them the mental space that they would need to concentrate on the spiritual work that he had brought them into the wilderness to do. Because in the wilderness, God was transforming a motley group of slaves into an independent nation 
who would see themselves as the people of God. That was a tremendous shift in identity. And it was not easily accomplished. It takes a lot of mental and spiritual energy for human beings to learn to think differently about their world, to learn to see ourselves in new ways. It takes a lot of mental and spiritual energy to become different people. And God knew that the Israelites couldn't make the changes that they needed to make to their lives if they were constantly using all of that energy just to survive. So God provided sufficient food for their daily needs in order to free them to do the spiritual work of becoming the people of God. The disciples heard in Jesus' words that identity-changing story of the wilderness. Give us this day bread sufficient to meet the day's needs, Jesus told them to pray. Give us enough bread that we can put aside our worry about physical survival and focus on our spiritual selves. Enough bread that we have the time and energy to do the work of becoming the people that God intends for us to be, to do the work of creating a better world for others as well. Those seven words that trip off of our tongue so easily every Sunday when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Are there to free us to consider the nature of our lives. When our physical needs for survival have been met, when we have received our daily bread, what are we going to do with the blessing of the time and the resources that we still have left to us? Are we using them to become the people that God wants us to be? Over this past year, the pandemic has stripped away many of our routines and the activities that we used to use to fill our excess time. And because of it, I think we've all been forced into a greater awareness of which things we've been doing that were truly essential to our spiritual well-being and which were unimportant. Many of us miss the rhythms of the liturgical season and predictable family gatherings. So we may do with virtual candlelight at the Christmas Eve service, with Zoom calls with our family. The rhythms of the year have felt muted. And for many of us, we became much more acutely aware of the meaning that those rhythms have given to our lives. Some people went on shopping sprees during the pandemic trying to ease the boredom with toys, only to discover with acute sadness that possessions are a poor substitute for people. Some of us found that the pandemic taught us how much we enjoyed spending less time at the office and more time with family. And then there were others who came to realize that they had been using work to escape problems in their relationships, problems they were now forced to face in the cloistered space of the environment, of confinement. And the pandemic taught us the blessings of attentiveness to small wonders around us, to blossoming of an orchid on the windowsill, the antics of a cat, a beautifully baked loaf of bread, the sun turning new snow into a field of diamonds, things that we may just not have taken time to look at before. And all of us have learned the blessing of seeing a smile on a person's face and the warmth of a hand held out in welcome. These were things that maybe we had not been giving our attention to before. When our daily needs are met, when we have received bread sufficient to the day's needs, what do we do with the blessing of the time and the resources that we have left to spend? Are you using them to pay attention, to strengthen your spiritual self, are you just cluttering your soul with time wasters? And by time wasters, I don't just mean playing Candy Crush on your phone. Think of all the time wasters that we engage in, the hurts that we collect, the vengeances we nurse, the envies, the empty pursuits, the needless indulgences, 
all of the stuff that we believe is going to make us happy, but in the end is only carrying us farther away from the whole person that God intends for us to be. A writer contemplating the nature of his life told of a lecture that he remembered from a philosophy class that he had taken years before in college. A lecture, he said, that continued to inform his choices to this day. I remember that my professor stood before the class that day with some items on a table in front of him. And when we had all assembled in the room, he wordlessly picked up a very large and empty mayonnaise jar. And then he filled it to the top with golf balls. He asked us, is this jar full? And we all said, yes, it is. Our professor then picked up a box of pebbles and poured them into the jar. He shook the jar lightly and the pebbles rolled into the open areas between the golf balls. He asked us again, is the jar full? We agreed, yes it was, though you could begin to see the questions in some of our eyes. Next he picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. The sand poured between the crevices of the pebbles and he asked once more, is the jar full? We responded with a unanimous yes, smiles breaking out on our faces. Finally, he brought out two cups of coffee from under the table, and he poured the coffee into the jar, effectively filling even the empty space between the sand. This time, he didn't need to ask his question. We simply laughed, knowing the answer. Now, said our professor, as our laughter subsided, I want you to recognize that this jar represents your life. The golf balls are the important things. Family, faith, friends, your passions, the things that fill your soul. Things that if everything else was lost and only they remained, your life would still be full. The pebbles are the things that make life a little easier, like your job, your house, your car. And the sand is everything else, the small stuff. I want you to remember, he told us, becoming serious. The order in which I filled the jar. If I had put the sand into the jar first, there would have been no room for the pebbles or the golf balls because the sand would have filled up every bit of space. And the same goes for life. If you spend all your time and energy on the small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are important. So take care of the golf balls first. Take care of the things that really matter. The rest is just sand. I asked my professor, but what does the coffee represent? A professor smiled and said, it's there to show you that no matter how full your life may seem, there is always room for a couple of cups of coffee with a friend. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, give us this day our daily bread, that which is sufficient to meet our physical needs, so that we may spend our time and our resources on what is most important. Family, friends, faith, on doing the spiritual work of becoming better people and building a better world for all of us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
stand for the benediction? Now deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the singing brook to you, deep peace of gentle hearts to you, deep peace of the light of the world to you. Go in peace, now and forever. Amen. Those who wish to stay on Zoom for a virtual coffee hour can do that, and the rest of you will see you next week. <laughs>